brain is an overarching principle which is to minimize threat and maximize reward. Now, the shape of those two arrows are not accidental because the brain has five times more threat circuitry than it does reward circuitry. So what that means is that we're all inherently conservative. We all have an inherent desire and preference to protect the downside of any discussion, negotiation, bargain, purchase, deal that we conduct, and only then maximize the upside. So we will always seek, or mostly seek, to minimize the risk before we seek to achieve the reward. So that's a really interesting and important thing to consider when we consider strategic thinking and decision making. The two represents the conscious and the non-conscious effects. Now, some crazy German neuroscientist, Manfred Zimmermann, kind of decided to measure the processing ability and speed of the conscious versus non-conscious in terms of bits per second. He obviously had a data science kind of background. And these are actual figures from his study at the time. Now, we kind of know that maybe those figures aren't entirely correct, but the proportionality is. So 40 bits per second are processed consciously, and 10,999,960 bits per second are processed non-consciously. So the brain lives primarily by non-conscious automatic processes. A lot of your decision-making, a lot of the intentions that you express, a lot of the reactions that you have to what goes on around you are really driven by the non-conscious part of your brain. And finally then, just skimming through the four key processes again, the first process that happens within an instant is an emotion. An emotion is actually an action cue, which is involuntary, unconscious from the environment. If you hear a loud noise, you can't help yourself from being startled. Did I give you a fright? I beg your pardon. <laughs> I saw his eyes just kind of raise. You can't stop that. So it's an involuntary automatic response. And that is your brain detecting at the speed of light almost this action cue. So if you're walking along and you hear a screech of brakes, you'll turn around instinctively. If you hear the fire alarm, you'll react instinctively. Now what happens seconds later is that emotion is conveyed to your body by way of a feeling. So you feel that emotion. It might be your heart beat increasing. It might be your breathing becoming shallow. Well, this feeling in the pit of your stomach that, hey, something's wrong here. And those are all, if you like, the ways that the brain communicates to the body that something has been detected that represents potential danger. And that's not a coincidence, incidentally, because it's one of the factors of evolutionary biology which has allowed the species to survive that we've been so keen and aware of danger in our environment. Now, the danger in our environment when we first lived in caves and lived in the bush were things like saber-toothed tigers and elephants and, you know, animals and people coming to kill us. And so we are immediately alerted to a sudden movement in the bush or the sound of an unusual kind of dialect which represented something other than our tribe. Today, we don't live in that environment, most of you, unless you spend a lot of time on the roads here. But we don't actually face much of the physical danger these days. The real danger that is detected by the brain these days is social danger. And social danger is registered in exactly the same way as physical danger. Let me give you an example of social danger. So you're at school, right? And at recess time, you always play touch footy. And it's a small playing field. There's only space for 10 players, five aside, but there are 15 in the class. So you all stand on the side of you and you elect two captains, and the captain picks, you know, one captain picks and then the other captain picks, and you're standing, hoping to hell that you're gonna get picked. You know that feeling? Okay. Or you're the only kid in the class that doesn't get an invite to the birthday party. Or you're the only one who isn't featured in the picture on Facebook where they had a fantastic time, all your friends. It's that feeling of being excluded, left out, not important, or not being considered. That's registered as a social danger and has a profound effect on your cognitive capacity, even though we're not aware of it. Thinking is the process you then use to make sense of that feeling. And sadly, unfortunately, as a result of a lot of the socialization processes, women are better at it than men. 
Men are just taught to, I might just ignore that bloody feeling. You know what to do, go and do it. Whereas the women kind of feel, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here. What's going on? What's going on? And they're much more guarded and they're much more prepared to really think about those feelings. And that's just not a brain difference, let me be very clear. It's just a socialization difference, the experiences we had growing up. And then finally, you have self-regulation, which is really what determines uh, what is socially appropriate. So my staff, he doesn't have uh, much self-regulation, he's getting old. Pretty much what happens as you get older is that self-regulation begins to taper off. So if I show him a piece of pizza, he'll eat my hand off to get the pizza. That's no self-regulation. Or your mother-in-law, when your first child is born and asks, what do you call the baby? And you say, Marissa, and she says, oh, I've never liked that name. That's lack of self-regulation. They just say what they think. Okay. So what that does is it takes us to now an application of all of this to how we think.